And so I want to begin by introducing uh, our first speaker. And once again, when something historic happens, it's, it's, it's appropriate to identify it as such. Well, our first speaker has been instrumental in bringing a historical event, a Marian historical event, to the United States. Bishop David Ricken is the 12th bishop uh, of the Diocese of Green Bay. He was educated in Rome, in Louvain, as well as in the United States, receiving degrees in canon law and in theology. He began as the Bishop of Cheyenne and then became Bishop of Green Bay. He was also raised to the Episcopacy by Pope St. John Paul II, and I know it's true because he took off his uh, Episcopal ring and showed me the insignia of the Holy Father on the inside. So we have documentable evidence <laughs> that he was indeed uh, raised to the Episcopacy. I say this uh, truly from my heart. Uh, bishop Ricken is commonly known as Our Lady's Bishop. Now why? It's, it's remarkable. Because as he said at dinner last night, he simply refuses her nothing. And the Blessed Mother doesn't have so many people that, he can that she can uh, use knowing that they will always say yes. So living consecration, like Bishop Ricken does, means he's busy for Our Lady. He's busy saying yes often. Now, the history is that Bishop Ricken oversaw the first church-approved Marian apparition in the history of the United States. And that's a momentous accomplishment. And he has come, uh, and as so many of you, uh, at least uh, our speakers, are risking hurricane, and again, we're gonna keep, uh, Every day we have a holy hour, we will have the rosary. We want to keep in mind uh, deeply the people uh, who are facing the hurricane as we are now speaking about Our Lady and the remedy for things like natural disaster and war uh, and degeneration. Uh, but Bishop Ricken is going to speak about how Our Lady shows her role as the co redemptrix and Mediatrix of all graces in action. She comes, she visits us. This is not because things are idle in heaven. It's because we need her on earth. We need these reminders to return to the gospel. And so to have the very first Marian apparition approved by the church in our country is a remarkable feat and, as Bishop Ricken probably will not say, caused great personal suffering on his part because that's always the way of serving Our Lady. There will always be suffering and then a historic victory. So without further ado, I want to introduce Our Lady's Bishop, Bishop David Ricken of Green Bay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mark. It's a joy to be with all of you. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when, whenever you're with people who love our Blessed Mother, there's a beautiful, beautiful atmosphere there of peace and joy. And I definitely sense that this morning. So Your Excellency, it's a joy to be with you. Uh, to my brother priests who are here as well, to the sisters in consecrated life and brothers in consecrated life, it's a joy to be with you. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you for being here. And uh, we have high school students as well. Wow, you can't get better than that. So thank you for being here too. God bless you. I just want to uh, tell you a, a story, a true story, that goes back a long time ago and is just now becoming uh, more available to many more people. So it's a story of Our Lady of Good Help. Anyway, let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the story of Our Lady of Good Help. Uh, this is located in Champion, Wisconsin, and it's a tiny little farming region and area. In 1859, Our Lady appeared to a young Belgian immigrant named Adele Bryce. Adele Bryce had come with her parents at the invitation of the American government, many Belgians came to that area of Door County, uh, which is where uh, the shrine is located and uh, where our Blessed Mother appeared. Before she came, she lived in a town called Campion, Champion, as we say in English. And later on, Adele was able to rename the little village which was near her home. Uh, it had several names over the, over the course of time, but she was able to rename that to uh, champion. And this is the area where our Blessed Mother appeared. You see it on the, the slide here behind me. It's still a very rural area. It is farming territory now. 
And, but always this area where she appeared uh, in the Diocese of Green Bay, what is now the Diocese of Green Bay, is very rural and very agrarian, as you can see. You see there's a forested area there. That's what it looked like, probably something very similar to that in 1859 when the Blessed Mother appeared to Adele Bryce. The shrine itself is the little uh, church that's on an angle there. That's the where she appeared. Is we, we recognize that down in the crypt area. It's called the crypt area or the apparition chapel. That's downstairs underneath the main chapel. The main chapel is still very small as well. only holds about 250 people. So the area is very, very small. And in many ways, this has been the best kept secret in Christendom uh, for all these years because the local people love it so much and they kind of like to hold on to it a bit, maybe too much. But now this has been an invitation for them and for all of us to grow in our understanding of what Mary did in our location and how she really led Adele into a, a mission for her whole life. So the Blessed Mother appeared in an unlikely place. That sounds pretty normal, doesn't it? Usually she does appear in a very unlikely place. It was originally known as Alles Primea Baus. It was later named Robinsonville and then Champion, which was the name she herself gave to the town from her hometown in Belgium, Campion. And that's where she migrated from with her parents. Marketed to the Brabant region of Belgium by the US government in the 1850s, in order to draw settlers. They were trying to recruit people from Europe to come and settle North America and to settle in this area of Wisconsin. And there was uh, farming that needed to be started and the lumbering uh, industry was moving in. And so there was a lot of change happening in uh, Belgium, which had been very, very primitive. So several thousand came and among them was the Bryce family in 1855. Now, uh, she was from Wallonia in Belgium, the southern part of Belgium, which is French-speaking. And uh, the name probably should be Brice, but we, they have always pronounced it in Wisconsin as Bryce. And so that's the name that is stuck there, the pronunciation. It's in a wooded, rugged land, not yet tamed for fruitful farming when they first came. Life was very, very difficult for those early settlers, as you might imagine. So here she was with her family trying to eke out an existence and begin a farm. There was stones all over, even to this day in the farms, people find a lot of heavy stones all over that area. So they were removing stones, they were cutting down trees. It was very labor intensive. There were trails through the woods connected ordinary life, skirting impassable swamps and, to con and contact with the native inhabitants. There were a lot of Native Americans in the area. They had a fairly good system of trails all uh, walking trails that kind of connected one community with another. And the people, when they first arrived, started to use those trails, as did Adele, and one day her whole life changed. This was definitely missionary territory. You see in the little graphic map graphic here, uh, the bottom of the Bay of Green Bay, the Green Bay it's called for that reason, and Champion is just right up from the bottom of the Green Bay. The city of Green Bay is at the very bottom of the bay itself. So who was this Adele Bryce? She was a Belgian immigrant, age 28 at the time of the apparition. She probably came to the United States around the age 24. Now that's interesting. Now in this time when we really need to connect with young adults, here's one that was connected to Mary, uh, very young at age, only 28 when this happened, a young adult kind of searching a little bit in an entirely new land, and I'll fill that in in just a minute. She was only lightly educated to about the second grade level, but she could not read or write. She was illiterate. Her parallels with Sister Bernadette of Lourdes, which happened almost a year earlier, are truly striking. Uh, there Our Lady appeared as the Immaculate Conception. I'll tell you what title she gave to Adele in just a couple minutes. Due to an accident while making lye soap, she was disfigured in the face and was blinded in her right eye. So when you see pictures of her, there's a, a blind right eye that's sort of blackened there, uh, not real attractive from that point of view, but that was something she had to deal with her whole life. I can imagine that she was probably made fun of and uh, looked, looked askance at at different times, but uh, that was something that she had to live with because of that accident. By all reports, she was a happy, faithful, and obedient woman from a strong, faith-filled family. Here's someone's rendition. She was 
<clears throat> on the road, on this uh, trail, walking to carry uh, wheat to the grist mill to have it turned into flour, uh, to be made into uh, bread, and etc. And on the way, she, she had a beautiful, beautiful thing happen to her, which frankly, at first, she was at first by herself in October 8th, scared the death out of her. She didn't know what that was or what it was all about. She was very upset. So a lady appeared twice to a dell between two trees, one a maple, the other the hemlock. Now that's not the hemlock bush, the hemlock tree, which is different, along a rural trail. This is a recent artist's rendition of uh, the description that Adele has left for us. Mary was a young woman, a beautiful woman, uh, clothed in radiant light and a white dress, had a gold sash around her waist and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Beautiful. <clears throat> She discussed the appearance of the lady with her priest. Now, the priest was in Bay Settlement, which is quite a, quite a distance walking. She had to walk many miles to get from her home over to the town and to where the, the church was. And all the people in that area would have had to walk to, work, to prayer and out to walk to mass and walk to uh, business. So it was a lot of walking going on. And the uh, priest told her, well, for heaven's sakes, ask her in God's name, who are you? and what do you want of me? Typical type of a request, huh? Who are you, and what do you want of me? She said, I am the queen of heaven. Now, just about a year before, she came as the Immaculate Conception. Here she comes as the queen of heaven. Often, uh, we know in divine providence, there are inclusios, beginnings and ends, and what happens in between is very significant. Uh, no one, as far as I know, has had the chance to study what was going on in between these two apparitions of the Blessed Mother, one in the old country in France and one here in the United States. Interesting that she comes here as the Queen of Heaven. I am the Queen of Heaven and right away gives a definition of what she does, who prays for the conversion of sinners. And I wish you to do the same, who prays for the conversion of sinners. Now, when was the last time you heard that kind of language? And yet it's so central uh, to the meaning of the gospel and so common to what the Blessed Mother tells people when she appears to them. You received Holy Communion this morning and that as well. So Blessed Mother knows Adele, knows her well, knows all about her, knows that she'd just been to Mass and Holy Communion. But you must do more. Make a general confession and offer communion for the conversion of sinners. So she wanted Adele to get caught up with the sacrament of confession to make a general one and offer communion for the conversion of sinners. There's a lot we can call out of that practice. Can you imagine, you know, instead of worrying about your, your children and grandchildren who might not be practicing the faith, offer your Holy Communion for them. When you go up to receive Holy Communion, have someone in mind and offer your Holy Communion for the conversion of that person and the return to the practice of the faith and to an awareness of Christ and the mission given to us today. So then she said, if they do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. So this is the invitation, the invitation of conversion, of mercy coming first, but then the consequences are quite real and severe. Then my son will be obliged to punish them. So you wonder, are we, we've been in a time of great mercy, but now a time is, could be running shorter and we need to get our lives in proper order as individual followers of Jesus and as a church that we are truly ready uh, to be more disponible, as, as they say, uh, disponibilità in Italian spirituality, available to God's purposes and his mission. And Mary is one of the best one, is the best one to teach us that, actually. Young Adele asks, but what more can I do, dear lady? <clears throat> Gather the children in this wild country and teach them what they should know for salvation. So this is a catechetical mission that she gave to Adele. Because remember, the children had not been catechized. When the Belgians came here uh, to this country, they had kind of, it was so far to go to church, and they had gotten very lax there in Door County. Uh, it's called the Door County Peninsula. You know that finger, as you saw on the map there, this thumb is the Door County Peninsula and Kiwani County, etc. But that's where she appeared, and she was worried about the children in this wild country. Teach them what they should know for salvation. So give them the basic evangelization. 
help them to start to understand the catechism, prepare them for the sacraments. But how, do, how shall I teach them who know so little myself, Adele asked. Remember, she was not very well educated. Second grade, we think. Mary replied, teach them their catechism, how to sign themselves with the sign of the cross, and how to approach the sacraments. This is what I wish you to do. Very simple, very fundamental. It makes you wonder, is this all happening now with this approval? Because we need to start over with our children and our grandchildren. Teach them the basics. When we try to get too fancy, too theological, when we're raising children and grandchildren, then somehow it goes right over their heads. We have to help them to understand, to model for them that we are men and women of prayer, that our families are households of prayer and discipleship, and we need to help them to approach the sacraments and to love, uh, love God and love the Blessed Mother. Her last words to Adele were, go and fear nothing, I will help you. So this is what stuck, I will help you. That was the last words. Adele, she couldn't write this down, so other people wrote this story down for her, what the Blessed Mother had said to her, and voila, that's all the message there is. Wasn't hard for me, I didn't have to worry about you know, heterodoxy or something that wasn't orthodox in these messages. I didn't think, but we had everybody drill down into it and see if there was anything there that could even possibly be questioned on a doctrinal or theological basis. <clears throat> it was not a problem, at least according to the three experts. The nickname stuck, however, our Lady of Good Help. Now, you know that's in the tradition. Those of you who studied Marian theology or history, you know a little bit about, about that. Bon secours, good help in French, prompt succor. This is a part of our tradition, and this is what stuck more than Our Lady Queen of Heaven. I am the Queen of Heaven. But we need to remember that that's how she appeared. That's who she told Adele she was. Now, a little bit about Adele. As a young girl, she had promised with her girlfriends growing up that they made a vow to the Blessed Mother to go to religious life. And in another part of the apparition, uh, the locutions, she says, uh, your friends are all in religious life in Belgium. Where are you? And then Adele gave an explanation. Well, I was told by, and the Blessed Mother just smiled at her. I was told by my pastor I should accompany my parents, and that would be the more charitable thing to do. So she gave a little explanation, and the Blessed Mother just smiled at her. So she gave her the same mission, an entirely new country, in an entirely new situation, undeveloped situation, where people really needed to hear the gospel and to be catechized in faith. This was probably the family home, we think, here. And uh, this is not too far from the shrine. It's on one of those Indian trails that lead to the place where the shrine is now. We don't have exact records, but we can pretty well uh, calculate about where that trail was. Uh, this was probably her household home later on after the family had uh, died or abandoned it. It was there for a long time. We still have the foundations of that building, though, and we hope to somehow develop that into a, one of the sta stations or the stops along the way in the Marian journey. So Adele steadfastly carried forth to the extent of her abilities. She walked farmstead to farmstead within a 30-mile radius, working the daily chores to free the children for an hour of evening instruction. So very wise. Adele was not educated, but she was extremely wise. She took that mission seriously. She went out to the families in their homes. What do we call that today? Evangelization. And she did it on foot for sometimes 30 miles at a time. It was in a 30-mile radius. She would go to the parents and say, who she was, and she said, I promised the Blessed Mother I would instruct the children, and would you allow me to do household chores so that then I could have an hour or two at night instructing the children in the faith? Well, this is how smart she was. The parents were listening in. These are small homes, you know. So they were listening in. They who had either lost the faith or maybe had been uncatechized themselves, now they are recipients of the catechetical uh, message of Adele, and a very simple explanation of the faith, teaching the sign of the cross, prepare them for the sacraments. She lived a holy and simple life, carrying out the mission Mary gave to her until the date of her death on July 5th, 1896. So um, this is the schoolhouse that she built. At one time it was residential. 
Uh, then another time it was for handicapped children. It's had many different uses and purposes. That building is still there and it's still in good shape. It's been very well cared for. It's now kind of a hospitality center. We have the gift shop in there and a little cafe in there. But uh, the up, upper floor is where the priests live. The Fathers of Mercy staff the Our Lady of Good Help and they do a fine job. And uh, it's really growing uh, since 2010, a lot. This was one of the earlier churches. There's a new church built there in the early 40s. That's the picture you saw at the very beginning. So I want to tell you another story about a natural miracle, really, uh, that came as a result of intense prayer. This happened in October, October 8th, recognize that date, 1871, in and around Peshtigo, Wisconsin. So if you look up here on the left side of the bay, you will see, uh, let me turn over here, the left side of the bay, you'll see a little town called Peshtigo, if you can see that far, and Robinsonville, or the new chapel, is down here, that's Champion now. And the fire was incredibly intense. It started way up there, jumped across the bay, if you can imagine. In other words, it wasn't contiguous around the bottom of the bay. Jumped across the bay and into Door County and Kiwani County, etc. To this day, it remains the deadliest firestorm in the United States history, with estimated deaths of around 1,500 to 2,500 people. Totally devastating. Le left a scorched earth, uh, which you'll see in this picture. Faced with seemingly unstoppable conflagration of, of the Peshtigo fire, Adele gathered the local populace who were losing their farms and all their animals, all their buildings, their homes, their barns, etc., were burning down. Uh, she gathered the local populace at the chapel and led prayers throughout the evening, often confronting fire and smoke. And they had the statue of the Blessed Mother carrying it around. They would face the fire until they couldn't stand it anymore and walk over to the other side of the parameter of the property. Wouldn't you know? But their trust in the Lord was rewarded when the fire subsided exactly 12 years to the day after the apparition. And so what happened was all of a sudden a rain started and the rain snuffed out the fire. The fire damaged the outside of the wood, wooden white fence, picket fence, damaged the outside, we still have some of it, damaged the outside of the fence but did not come inside. So they said it was like an emerald isle in the midst of scorched earth. That's how terrible the whole area was around it. Let's talk a little bit about the approval process. Uh, I did not start this approval process. That was started by my predecessor, Bishop David Zubik, now the Bishop of Pittsburgh. He was uh, only in Green Bay for three and a half, four years. And uh, he heard the stories from the people at the shrine. And many of them were begging him to start an approval process. Well, when I came, I inherited a little note from him and said that this is really worth investigating and looking into. And one of the first things I heard when I arrived in the diocese, did you know that the Blessed Mother appeared here? I said, oh, really? Are you kidding me? So that was interesting. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And so they told me this story. They took me out so on this, my second day after arriving in Green Bay, took me to the Shrine of Our Lady Good Help, which is only about 15 miles outside of Green Bay. And uh, I started talking with people and visiting with them. All of them had family stories of cures, answered prayers, on and on it goes. And it wasn't an orchestrated or planned thing. I would just to talk to people who were there praying and they'd tell me about this relative or that relative. And it was, it, it, it was and still is an intimate part of their lives. But when they get engaged, couples will go to the shrine to ask for one another's commitment in front of the Blessed Mother statue. What a beautiful thing, huh? What a beautiful thing to happen. So it's de definitely a deep part of their identity, their lives, and it has been for all these years. But you might ask the question, why did it take so long? There wasn't really a formal process that a local bishop could use to validate whether something is authentic or inauthentic until 1978, when the Holy See published a document called Norms of the Sacred Congregation, for the doctrine of the faith on the manner of proceeding and judging alleged apparitions and revelations. We took this and followed it to the detail, to the nth degree, as, as much as we could. Uh, they gathered all of the documents. Um, my vicar general at the time was uh, Father John Durfler, uh, who is a moralist and a canonist, very, very thorough. With the help of another priest, he went to the archives of the shrine 
of the diocese, of the Sisters of the Holy Cross, who are Franciscan sisters in base settlement. They had a lot of archival material there because they were there 60 years uh, running uh, the shrine. And so they gathered all of that. I saw the stack at about this high of papers that then we turned over to three, three Marian uh, theologians. They read it for over a year, studied it. Uh, they came up with a precise for me, an executive summary of the whole thing, and then their opinion about whether or not this should be uh, granted approval by the local bishop. I must say I was pretty intimidated when I discovered that these apparitions cannot be approved except first by the local bishop. Only the local bishop can make that determination. Thank God they have a process. That's what I thought. And I don't have to make this up. I had been over to Lourdes a few years ago, and I asked to see the documents of the bishop there. And Lourdes, he did an extremely thorough job of uh, giving uh, app approbation to, to Lourdes and what happened to Bernadette and the messages, etc. Extremely thorough investigation. It was not easy for Bernadette to go through all of that, but we know that the fruits have been there all these years. Uh, it's interesting that the Blessed Mother here didn't say anything about healings, but healings are happening all the time. She didn't say anything about build, build me a church. No, but they built successive churches over time to respond to the needs. And so this is very simple message. Instruct the children in the faith. And Adele did great work through her evangelization, going home to home and bringing the faith to those families. So isn't it interesting now that when we're in this era of the new evangelization, it seems that her time has arrived as far as being known by the world, by the world, really, not just by a few people around where it happened. So I was intimidated, I must say, that only the local bishop can give this first approval. I was hoping the Holy See would say, well, we'll take over from here. Never got a letter like that. But every stage of the journey, we sem sent them everything we had when we came to a new phase of the investigation uh, and a declaration about what, what we had just studied. Sent that to them. Usually got a very short response back from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Thank you very much for all the information you have shared. Keep us informed. Move forward. So that was a good sign. Clear enough. Very simple. And we knew we had to take the next step. Unless something stopped it along the way. So we uh, chose three Marian theologians. Uh, one of them sort of played the role of the devil's advocate, which is very good. Uh, the other two uh, gave a very good uh, synopsis of it. One who has done a lot of these wrote to me in the last paragraph of his executive summary. He said, I've reviewed a lot of these types of reported apparitions. Uh, most of them are pr probably fraudulent. Many, no, many of them are fraudulent. Uh, this one is not. Good luck, Bishop. <laughs> so he knew that it would involve an awful lot. And uh, I appreciated uh, that candor, really, about the whole thing. So they took a year to review all of that material, and then they sent me their executive summaries. I took another six months to go through everything again myself, not all that data, but their summaries to pray about it, to talk to more people out in Door County. Uh, and um, I took a large gulp, and I said, Blessed Mother, I think we have to do this for you. So at the conclusion of my uh, declaration of this, this is what I wrote. The events, apparitions, and locutions given to Adele Bryce in October 1859 do exhibit the substance of supernatural character. And I do hereby approve these apparitions as worthy of belief, although not obligatory, by the Christian faithful. And so that was the de declaratory decree statement by which this was approved. People are encouraged to believe it. They're not obliged to believe it. Catholics are not obliged to believe it. No one's obliged to believe it. But certainly there's nothing in here that could lead you into error or be harmful to any soul. And so that's kind of our role as the bishop to, to determine whether or not this has authenticity and also if there's any possibility of harm that could come from it, uh, you want to stay away from that. So here's a little summary. Uh, Wisconsin, 1859, and I think these are some of the things that impress me. An unlikely place, that's where usually Mary comes. An unlikely recipient, a Belgian immigrant, 
This one's a little older than other uh, re recipients of uh, messages and apparition, but a consistent motherly message of faith and love was offered to the people, not just for Wisconsin, but for the world. Not too many people know about it yet. We're just trying to catch up out there, as you can imagine. But things have been happening. Miraculous things have been happening. And I was talking to Father John Broussard, who's the rector. He gets about every two months a very, we get a lot of letters of people saying their prayers were answered and they were touched deeply. We get a lot of uh, letters that now about every two months he told me of something that borders on the miraculous. We're keeping all those. I've already been in dialogue with uh, Dr. Alessandro Sandri, Sandri, I think his name is. He's the uh, chief uh, doctor in, the, in Lourdes, where they have a verification process based upon the church's uh, means of identifying those, whether something's a miraculous or not. And uh, he's going to be helping us to form a medical commission, eventually to examine these things to see if uh, they may be able to be verified as well. This, you see the crutches that have been left over the years on the left-hand side. And then a little uh, picture with children. The third girl from the left, uh, something miraculous happened to her. She's from Kansas City in Kansas, and she never had been able to eat anything solid. And she had a stoma put into her stomach where they would feed her liquid food and, and nutrition. And she was three at the th time, I think. And her mother and grandmother were with her and the children, they brought them to Our Lady of Good Help, and something odd happened. They pulled into the parking lot at Our Lady of Good Help, and the top of that stoma popped out. And the mother panicked. She said, I gotta get this kid to the, to the, to the uh, emergency room, because we can't have that, that uh, and it wouldn't go back in. She couldn't get it back in. So her mother said, the emergency room is right in there. She pointed to the chapel. So they went into the chapel, and they prayed before the statue of Our Lady of Good Help, and uh, they decided they'd just take their time. The girls seemed to be okay. And uh, <clears throat> on the way, um, they stayed about three hours, really enjoyed their visit. And they resolved, though, that the next morning they were going to take this little girl to the uh, emergency room to see if the doctor could put the, the top of the stoma back in. And they went in, and he looked at it, and he tried to push that thing in almost aggressively, couldn't get it back in, because the skin was already growing across the top. And on the way home to Kansas City, the little girl, for the first time, started to eat an apple, and she digested it. She has no problems taking solid food. So that's a beautiful, true story, and the parents attest to it, and they're very, very grateful. So that's just one. The, the, I think that's the, the one on the right to the right. I believe, I'm not sure if this is the little boy. I should have checked this out. I just noticed it this morning. But uh, I believe he was the one that was uh, cured from MS. Uh, so there, there are cures like that happening. And sometimes, fairly often, they involve little children. Well, kind of all adds up, doesn't it? It all kind of fits together. That's the way Mary does. So um, we've been praying a lot for holy families in my diocese. We had a year dedicated a prayer to prayer uh, to the holy family and praying together as families. By praying together as families and attending Sunday Mass faithfully, teach children to be faithful to Jesus in and through his body, the Catholic Church. And so we really want to emphasize the familial aspect here. Every family is on a journey of faith. It's important for parents and grandparents to pass on the faith to their children and grandchildren. That role is incredibly important. And Mary thinks so much of that role that she gave Adele this mission to teach the children. It's had a lot of good fruits in the diocese. Um, vocations respond courageously and generously to one's call, to marriage and family, priesthood, and religious life. So we have been having a, a vocation shortage but in the last few years, the number of seminarians is increasing. And the last year I was able to, to ordain five young men from the diocese, four service in the diocese, three this year. And so the pattern seems to be taking hold, although there are always a lot of challenges in that arena. Marriages and families are under assault, terrible assault by the culture. And we really need to help one another to be faithful to the beautiful gift of marriage and family life. You know that whole story. I don't need to tell you that. 
There is an increase in religious life in the diocese. Uh, we have a wonderful gift of uh, Denmark, uh, the Carmelites in Denmark. Uh, they are increasing in their vocations and their wonderful community there. And we have a brand new diocesan community uh, called the Missionaries of the Word. And they are dedicated to outreach of, of evangelization to youth and young adults. So the fruits are still happening. Um, and I attribute a lot of this to the Blessed Mother. So relevant and timely for today, becoming Catholic disciples is a fresh call of the church, development of the whole person through spiritual and academic formation based on the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the church. Opportunities for faith formation in families, Catholic schools, religious education, adult faith formation, forming disciples of all. All this can be attributed to the early missionaries, early settlers there, and I believe to the Blessed Mother through Adele, who established such great roots. Now, over on the picture on the right, that was uh, three, oh, it's coming up. three or four years ago, uh, we had an assembly for all the Catholic school children, grade school and high school. So we have 54 Catholic schools in the Diocese of Green Bay. Green Bay is a middle-sized diocese, so that's pretty good. They're struggling right now, but we're going to, we're having a, a big effort to assist them to get back their life and to continue to grow again. So the new evangelization, be a friend and follower of Jesus, and then go forth to make disciples of all nations. Go and fear nothing, I will help you. Go and fear nothing, I will help you. Say it together, go and fear nothing, I will help you. She means it, and she's with us today, she's helping us, we should not be afraid. And so as we say, uh, say this uh, conclu in conclusion, I want to say to invite you to come for a visit, to be a part of the mission of Mary, the first disciple. Think about that. In her womb, she learned from the Savior, her own son. She learned to be a disciple. We're called to be disciples as well. And there, she also has become the greatest evangelizer of all times. Several years ago, I spoke to someone from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and they have purported apparitions throughout the world of at least 300 or so all the time, ongoing apparitions that are being studied. And of course, it has to be discerned. But what does that say to you? Our Lady is desperate to bring souls to her son, Jesus. That's her role. She's the greatest evangelizer of all times. If you want to, be, to learn to be a disciple and an evangelizer of the gospel, go to her. She's the best teacher, and you can learn so much from her. So thank you very, very much. It's been a joy to be with you. Uh, I've been uh, a friend of the Blessed Mother for a long, long time. When I was four years old, I had terrible asthma attacks when I'd play outside or help my dad in the yard or whatever, and I'd come in and just couldn't get my breath, couldn't get my breath, and that was in the days before the atomizer came about, and my mom was a registered nurse, so I, I was glad for that. But the best thing my mom did was put me in her lap and pray the rosary when I'd have these asthma attacks. And after about two decades, I would get my breath back. And I've been close to the Blessed Mother ever since. Thank you very much. God bless you. So thank, thanks be to God for when the church does the discernment and we do have the gift of these apparitions, which help us to live to the heart of the gospel. It's never an either or. That's the beauty of our Catholic faith. We're not the either or church. We're the both and church. It's, it's, it's faith and works. It's scripture and tradition. It's grace and nature. And it's the deposit of faith and also the beauty of apparitions. So thank you, Bishop Rickon, for taking the time and we, yeah, it's a, it was a real grace. <laughs>